Hey and hello, my name is Gino Samuel and welcome back to Discographies Yes, the series in which I go through every studio album release by the progressive rock band Yes in excruciating detail. This is episode 22, so I recommend, if you haven't, watch the previous 21 to catch up. Link to the full playlist is in the description down below. Now, last that we heard from Yes, they were busy making an album of new material for the first time in seven years. This would also be the first studio album without bassist Chris Squire, who passed away in 2015. He was the only original member of the band ever since they got back together in 2009, and now will be the first ever release with zero original members. His protege, good friend and frequent Yes collaborator Billy Sherwood, has been the bassist of Yes since 2015, at least live, and has been doing a decent job of it. Of course, we got Steve Howe, who joined the band during the final mixing stages of their second album, and is also producing this album, interestingly, and contributing most of the songwriting credits. Alan White, of course, has been the drummer since 1972, though has seen better days, health-wise at least. Uh, Jeff Downs, who was the keyboardist on their 1980 album Drama, has been part of the group for 11 years now, somehow becoming one of the longest running keyboardists of the band, only topped by Tony Kaye, who played on seven of the band's albums. John Davison has been the lead vocalist for close to 10 years now, and this will be his second studio album with the band. Jay Shellen, who was the main live drummer for the band for on and off about five years now, because White's not strong enough to carry the sticks anymore, uh, joined in as an additional percussionist, and in some sources is cited as an official member of the band now, making, making the lineup of six members now. Anyway, now that we've got the good recap of the cast, The Quest, released on October 1st, 2021, features eight official songs, I guess, adding up to 48 minutes, which is kind of on the short side for the band. And then we also get a bonus CD of three songs, adding up to 13 minutes only. So what's going on here? Apparently they were in the mood to uh, self-restrict themselves and pretend that they were releasing a vinyl record. I mean, they are as well. But they tried hard to limit themselves to the maximum possible runtime of a vinyl record. So 48 minutes is still kind of high for vinyl, but it is possible though. I imagine for the vinyl release of this album is just the eight tracks with no bonuses. So anyway, what does this new Yes sound like? Things start off relatively amazing with the opening number, The Ice Bridge. This was first released with a music video on YouTube back in July, I think. I was there for the premiere and was quite excited by it. It sounded so much more lively and dynamic than anything off of Heaven and Earth in 2014. But there was something afoot. Originally credited to Jeff Downs, who apparently dug this out of a cassette from 1977, which included a lot of his music that he was making at the time when he was making radio jingles. He liked this thing from back then and decided to flesh it out for this album. He gave it to John Davison next, who added vocals, and the rest of the band closely followed. Some commenters said in the stream and in the comments of the video that the opening synth fanfare sounds a lot like uh, fanfare for the Common Man by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. I mean, which is isn't that a cover of an Aaron Copeland piece? Um, anyway, yeah, it does sound a bit like it, but most fanfares do. Uh, others say that it sounded a lot like The Dawn of an Era by composer and artist Francis Monkman. Now, I've never heard of him, so I was interested to see just where is this resemblance. Like, is it a riff that is similar in some places, or the general groove of the song? Literally everything is the same. This is plagiarism. <laughs> Every little section of this 1977 or 78 instrumental track, riff idea, melodic motif, it's all in the ice bridge as well. When confronted on Twitter with this claim, Downs defended himself, saying that it was on his tape of his ideas where he found it, almost suggesting that maybe Monkman copied Downs back in the day. But then Downs had a phone conversation with Monkman himself, and came to the realization that he did not, in fact, compose Dawn of an Era by Francis Monkman. <laughs> Somehow that album track wound up in Downs' personal tape collection back in the day, and uh, he thought that he wrote it over 40 years ago. They reached a resolution, and now Monkman is credited as a co-writer for the song. Fine. 
I hope what Down said is true and didn't just take Monkman's track as his own and try to pull one over on us, assuming that no one has ever heard of it. Kinda seems unlikely since he should realize how easy it is to find everything on the internet now and he would be caught soon enough. Maybe he didn't realize that he came up with it or he didn't come up with it, which is which is fine in some cases. It happens to me too. When I, when I come up with a melody or a song idea in my head, I sometimes have to think very hard on whether I actually came up with it or is it something I'm subconsciously plagiarizing, like my brain is remembering a tune I heard five years ago. In Downs' case, it's a more complicated issue since he apparently just listens to this cassette a recording of the original album release of Donny Venera, I, I guess, and thought he recorded it. Um, it's different when you actually listen to something instead of being in, in your head. Like, did he think it was his own natural style? Does it match with the instrumentation that he was using back in that time as well? Maybe it was a cover he did of, of the of the Mugman piece and he just put it on the tape. I, re I, I really don't know. Anyway, so this is basically a Yes cover of Donny Venera. In that case, it sounds great whatever. When the beat comes in, it's nice and fast, very punchy. It's just a very simple backbeat, just like... You know, if Ellen White was younger and more energetic, I think he could have come up with something more complex, like the way he used to play roundabout live, like... The bass is exciting as well. You're very pleased with the way it sounds. Moves around a lot has that crispy, chunky, bright quality, reminiscent of Squire's Rickenbacker, but also not quite the same. Basically, Chris Squire, you know, is the reason why the majority of bass guitars in Prague sound the way they do. Uh, Hal's guitar is pretty noodlesome. Uh, he, he retains his typical jazzy tone when something with a lot more bite would be much more appropriate, especially in this song. After this intro, the beat cuts out, and a cool, very modern sounding, I feel, synth line comes out of the shadows with a This keeps going as John shows up to sing a very complex melody. Sounds more like random disjointed notes. Those that have lived before da 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 since we don't hear a beat during this part from percussion or drums, it's very difficult to trace where does the melody or the beat fall. The opening two lines especially have a very wacky amount of autotune for some reason. It's like it was intentional to make him sound robotic or modern sounding, but since it's never that blatant afterwards, I think it's because John couldn't get to those notes comfortably enough in this section, so they had to perform autotune surgery on his vocals to get him to sing right. The lyrics are about climate change, apparently, um, and it's all over a bed of mostly one chord, at least in the verses. The line, All lies to the east, adds a new chord into the mix and introduces a halftime drum beat. The song in general features some of the most zany lyrics from the band in a, in a very long time, such as Sunflower Elder Crossed. John D really got into the prog spirit here. After this bit, they go into the mood of the beginning verse now, now with added bass and drums following in the footsteps of the intro arrangement. This helps to understand the vocal melody a bit better, because you hear that beat clearly and how it relates to the melodic path. It, but it's still too much to handle, and I think he could have simplified it a bit. It's so overly complex and jumps around so much. Sherwood, on the other hand, sounds great. He can't stay still. Another All Lies to the East bridge follows. There isn't really a chorus to speak of in this track. After this we get a backing line in the vision from Sherwood, I guess. Leads into this extensive last section, punctuated with these multilayer guitar runs. <laughs> Followed by a back and forth solo duel between How and Downs. Honestly, I'm very impressed with Downs' solos here. Really, the closest he's ever sounded like a Yes keyboardist. How is not too offensive either. By the way, this is like over two minutes long. Of those two going back and forth, and this is original, I suppose. Of course, it is based on the arrangements that are based on Monkman's track, but at least this is the most original moment in the song, you might say. Before one more final stringlet, and then a boom, <laughs> closes the song. 
mixed mixed feelings on this. Yes, this sounds great. They sound more youthful than in their previous album, but I must acknowledge that the core of the song is not yes. If it wasn't for Monkman, the band could never have come up with something this exciting. Next is Dare to Know, solely credited to Steve Howe. Opens with an ascending multilayered guitar pattern, which we will hear later on in different rearrangements and moods. This leads right into the full band enjoying an easy listening type of groove, supporting a descending sequence led by jazzy guitar, which personally, I feel it's a bit too overbearing in the mix. Some nice tom fills are played in unison with the bass here, and this bit is followed by a darker section that is based around the opening guitar pattern now. Here, the bass is moving in harmony with the guitar, which is awesome, something that they used to do quite a bit in the 1970s, but haven't heard this all that much recently. There's some orchestral stabs even thrown in here too, but this isn't a keyboard setting. They actually have an orchestral section playing on this track, the first time in 20 years since magnification. The orchestrations were composed by Paul Joyce, who is a Yes fan, and he is the guy who wrote the theme song for Bob the Builder. And the orchestration was recorded by the 47-piece Fames Orchestra in Skopje, North Macedonia. How exotic. How exotic. After a few cycles of this, we get a new pattern idea, which is yet another descending pattern on guitar. This leads into the verse melody. How and Davison sing in unison. I've got an idea. Been on my mind. I'd share it with you. To see what we will find. As a matter of fact. Lots of acoustic guitar is tinkling now in the back. The melodic movement is intriguing, pleasant and complex. After only this one verse, we are treated to an orchestral section of all things, <laughs> right in there. <laughs> it's based on a couple of the melodies, both instrumental and vocalized, that we've heard already. And now they're heard in a very sweeping, majestic fashion. This was apparently Howe's vision. He, he wanted an orchestral section to come out at this moment. I mean, it works. In spite of all the negative things I say about Howe, sometimes he comes up with, with great stuff. It's progressive, truly, in this track. It doesn't stick around for too long and concludes with a lead up into an opening melody variation now played on a fady indie guitar with long sustained notes in the back. It's very reminiscent of something you might hear on topographic oceans. Long sustained chords in the back. Kinda wishy-washy and dreamy. Then a new verse comes in based on this descending melody. Do 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 It's arranged quite differently here. It's more basic, it's more heavy in its steps. And the classical guitar comes out to fill out the breaks in the vocals. Surprise modulation, and then another verse in a similar mood. Then they move into a guitar interlude with a diminished, worrisome variation of the verse melody. Love this playing around of the melodic ideas that are reconstructed and put back together in different moods and fields. It's like something off of drama, really. And then a callback to sections heard at the beginning. We get a reprise of the opening verse as well, complete with vocals. Kind of classical in, in a structure with exposition first, then development, and then finally recapitulation or hearing again of the original utterances of these motifs. Then the opening guitar verse shows up again, and as expected, with some light orchestra in the back. You think it's the end, but we get a new motif at the very conclusion, led by a couple of acoustic guitars, playing a simple pattern which ends unresolved and worrisome. Personally, I think this track is great. It's quite daring, and it's a lot more daring than anything off of Heaven and Earth. Though having said that, I think mixing-wise, I feel the the drums are a bit odd sounding. Uh, it's not like in Heaven and Earth where they just feel washed out and far away. It's like they were they are aware of of the problem now, the issue of Alan White being physically weak and not as able to play strongly. So they compensate with compression to create a bigger sound. Um, that's what I imagine is happening, but I might be wrong. Next is Minus The Man, one of two collaborations on the album between Davison and Billy Sherwood. They had also, by the way, recently worked together in the so-called supergroup Arc of Life, who released one album thus far to some generally, mostly negative reviews. 
Anyway, it starts slow with lingering guitar, a wandering bass, and a held string pad with free rhythm, playing a vintage-like chord progression. Drums usher in the verse in 3-4 time. We're back to a difficult to pin down vocal melody again, and uh, I think it's about modern society and coming to terms with a digital reality and whether it is good for society. That rhymed a lot. A little guitar interlude joins the verse to the chorus, which is pretty lengthy actually. You know, the combo of the strong but slow rhythm, the reverby drums, the chord progression, they all really make it sound like something off of Union. Davison goes pretty high on the line, It's a double-edged sword! <clears throat> There's a lot of harmonies all the way through. Some lines overlap each other, so it's pretty complex given the chords that they're sitting on already. There's some pretty nice riffs on synth strings heard here to fill up the space left by vocals. <laughs> the titular. Minus the man. Blast into a guitar melody that leads into another verse which is now more complex in its arrangement. They're really riding on the orchestral groove established in the previous track, with a lot of synth flutes flying around along with strings. After the verse, there's a little guitar solo which doesn't tickle me much. It's based on sequences again, and that's Howe's new thing I guess. A phasey electric piano playing block chords ushers in a new low key section that shortly leads into a reprise of the chorus section chords, mostly led by another Howe solo now. I just realized now that the chorus reminds me a bit of No Way We Can Lose off of their Open Your Eyes album, and in the sense that it has a similar pulsing and ascending bass line throughout. I mean, it makes sense since it's a Sherwood composition. And then we get one more chorus for the finale. A little pause lute follows with one final minus the man in a cappella, closing the song. It was cool. You can definitely feel that it is a Sherwood composition, contrasting quite starkly with Hal, who is the author of the next song, Leave Well Alone. At over 8 minutes, this is the longest track on the album. It opens with a simple descending motif on what I believe is a dulcimer. Ba, ba, ba. Something that we'll hear a lot in different shapes and colors later. You don't know what to expect at first, but then suddenly... The band kicks things off, sounding like a slightly more upbeat number now, accentuated by booming Asia-like synth brass stabs. They do the cycle a few times, go through different iterations of that opening melody on guitar as well. Then it all cuts out as an acoustic guitar pattern in 6-8 time introduces a definite new section of this piece. We're getting into quite proggy territory now. This gets very mystic as vocals come in. Davison and Howe sing in unison once again, but Davison is singing incredibly low, lower than what I thought was possible for him. The mix on Howe's voice is also really interesting. It's like they removed th the entirety of the bottom end of his voice, which is basically most of his voice. And then what you get is just his treble consonants. So it's pretty cool to have the bottom thoroughly occupied by John Davison here. <laughs> that hammered dulcimer comes back to do some magical sounding chords here as well. The melody is lovely and sophisticated and matches the mood very well. This section closes rather quickly with a repetition of the abyss. Then full band come in and guitar plays a pattern going up as the bass goes for a walk. How is getting incredibly repetitive with, with his patterns lately. Then we revisit the mysterious low melody again with a more enriched instrumentation now. There's some mallet percussion thrown in to make it sound like spies. Uh, bass and drums join halfway. And then back into the guitar pattern we go. The notes could have been better, but I appreciate this more classic yes structure now. Then a return to the beginning cool 4-4 riff on guitar bass and synth brass chords again. Vocals are more harmonic now, but still not very high in their register, still sticking pretty low to the ground. 
Lots of repetition of leave alone. Then another new section follows. It's more hopeful in mood. A unison melody carried by vocals and picked guitar. A steady tambourine in the back keeps the rhythm. Very mid 70s sounding. Stories. This sequence lasts four runs through of the melody, and then another upward flowing Steve pattern section. I like how different the bass sounds with every cycle. Downs hasn't been doing much, honestly, during this song, mostly is just long held chords under how. Steve is the top to Jeffrey's bottom. This section then firmly concludes, and what we get next is a 3 4 movement, first introduced by joint acoustic and electric guitar playing a chord pattern that will pretty much continue until the end of the song. It's a slow build-up of sound and intensity as how noodles and doodles away through a guitar solo, a la Starship Trooper. Anyway, this is a great way to make the song longer, isn't it? By shitting out a two-minute guitar solo at the end. Personally, at eight minutes, this song doesn't really warrant a two or three minute solo, I guess. If it was 12 or 15 minutes, then I get it. At the very end, the melody on guitar repeats, but the chords under it keep changing, which is nice to see how the notes can interact with different chords and how it makes it sound different when put together. It ends quite unresolved, which is also a thing that Steve loves doing on this album. I feel like this track started off great, but then kind of lost focus halfway through. It was a nice attempt at going back to their roots, I think. Next up is The Western Edge, another Davison and Sherwood collaboration. Slow strings open up to an epic start with proggy lyrics. We are one constellation! The arrangement consists of a full band strike on each new chord and then just lingers. A celestial sea, the moment of reality. <laughs> Synth strings fill up the space a lot. It's a cool melody, but it's tricky again. It does go pretty high at some points, which is nice. Then a slight mood change, and little acoustic guitar chords introduce a solo vocal line from Billy Sherwood. Only one breath for us! Turn in the corner, changing everyone to come together again! It sounds like he's struggling to reach those high notes on the record. And this, this overlapping of vocal lines is, I think, a common trait in his compositions. But it's really, re it's refreshing and nice to hear someone else other than John or Hal sing on a Yes album. We get a halftime feel from the drums as we continue this little back and forth between John and Billy. The bass line kicks ass so much. After a suspension in this musical journey, we travel into a new normal double time groove and lots of slided guitar playing a recurring melody doubled with strings they go back to the first melody from the opening but now retaining this upbeat rhythm then back into a halftime section we go i guess this will count as our verse and chorus for the moment but they're so different every time in terms of arrangement and lyrics too downs is on the keys and doesn't do much again and neither does steve howe actually I feel like this compares with his contributions to Open Your Eyes, which of course saw Sherwood in a very commanding position on the album, which originally wasn't supposed to be Yes at first. How just showed up back then to do a solo here and there, really, and didn't do much for it. It kind of seems like this is the case in this song, too. He just really doesn't like Sherwood, I feel, and his little contributions are the only thing that he's willing to do to put his name on it and call the track part of Yes. I gotta commend White and Sherwood in this number, very energetic and lively. The song reminds me a bit of Spock's beard, but maybe I'm wrong in that assumption. The music accelerates up to a coda sounding section and eventual double time again. But suddenly, a reprise of the initial line with the halftime feel comes around. Along the western edge. A reprise of the section further builds up and leads into one last. The western edge which very defiantly closes the track. Overall, I think it has great ideas, but it's, it's turned out to be a bit too rushed sounding. If it was closer to nine minutes or so, it could have more little bits in between what's already in the song um, to give itself more room to breathe. But it's nevertheless become one of my favorite tracks on this album. Next song is Future Memories, solely credited to John Davison. 
It opens with an acoustic pattern evoking a sense of uncertainty, and it's something I wouldn't expect from Steve Howe, and for good reason. According to the credits, it's Davison playing guitar on the song. Well, that makes more sense, because it sounds like something from a, the 1975 album. It's more contemporary in its chord structure than what Steve can come up with. When John starts singing, the song kind of takes on a sort of country western feel, while at the same time vaguely Celtic. Acoustic guitar remains fairly simple. For the verses, it's picking away at a single chord for the most part. When we get to the line, Future memories! Bass and electric guitar very subtly show up. The arrangement remains very subdued. We then reach the chorus, I guess for the song, with the line, From this moment forward! I don't wanna make another memory without you. At this part, Davidson strums chords on his guitar. You know, the song sounds a lot like the kind of acoustic love belt that a 70s heavy metal band would record to show off their sensitive side. Also, it does remind me of something UFO might have come up with back in the day. Anyway, we go back into a quiet guitar and vocals arrangement for the verse again, with some added colorings of slidey guitar and fretless bass. It's all fretless to increase this idea of uncertainty and fluidity or some shit. In case you haven't noticed, there's absolutely no percussion or drums on this track. I didn't really get this track at first, but now I appreciate its freshness. It's not quite what I expected from the band, but hey, it works. Sometimes different things work out. In the lead up to the second chorus, John goes for a from my highest century line. Um, and he sounds a little breathless here, and it's not in an uncomfortable range for him. I don't know what's up with that. Anyway, an, uh, anyway, an organ playing sustained chords shows up now. Again, not much for Downs to do. He's just there because he has to be. A repeat of the chorus variates with some added backing reprieves. I don't want to make another memory. Then back to the opening tinkling as John states, Without you. A few times. It slows down and finishes. And it's, and it's nice. It's a really big switch from the bombastic fifth track to this more subtle sixth track. It is great. I would absolutely love to say that this is the end of the album and that there is no more. A bit short, but goddamn, they sounded awesome, all things considered. Unfortunately, I cannot say this because we still have five more tracks to get through. And from here on, things stop sounding this rosy. Next is... Is music to my ears by Steve Howe. <laughs> really? <laughs> You're really asking for it with that song title. Anyway. It opens with a gentle piano and acoustic guitar combination, playing through a chord sequence that we'll hear a few times. It's as if they heard the opening of Words on a Page from Oliver Wakeman's Yes release and, uh, and wanted to make something similar that, that sounds a bit like it. A single cycle follows with one more full band accompaniment, including an epic synth choir and periodic fills on toms. It takes an unexpected turn at the verse, a halftime feel, again, just when I felt it was gonna go hard. How and John sing as one, again. The accompaniment is incredibly basic, very simple beat, guitar strumming, and static notes on bass. A repeated chord progression of 1-4 in major continues on for the entirety of the verse. The melody itself is also nothing to write home about. The beat doubles in time to full time, I guess, for the chorus. It is music to my ears. Music to my ears. Music to my ears. The intensity builds up each time they sing the line until it resolves itself with the lyric, You found the way. The second verse is much the same, with some added background noodling from guitar and some additional harmonies as well. The second chorus is immediately followed by the third, which features more noodles, and now counter vocal melodies. Music to my ears, it's the best thing in disguise! Music to my And then is the obligatory yes middle eight section. Very angry diminished chords and runs from guitar. <laughs> This is something John Anderson would have been great at singing in a piece like this. A certain gritty vocal quality would make it sound great, which John Davison really lacks, and just perpetually sounds like a choir boy all the time. This section is just that one single chord, 
I mean, it's a nice chord. If I could frame it and hang it on the wall, I would, but eight times on this single chord with minimal change. <sighs> the vocal treatment is nice though, with some whimsical reverb and echo effects contributing a lot to make the vocals sound more interesting. If Howe had let Sherwood sing this line, I think he would have sounded great. This is followed by one more reprise of the instrumental opening section. Then, music to my ears. The chorus repeats three times. Some arpeggiation from synths adds more dynamic textures into the mix. In the last chorus, John does this repeating first syllable thing le leading up to his lines like, It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing in disguise. Which reminds me a lot of It Can Happen of their 90125 album, where in the verse they go, It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a constant fight. One final repeat of Far Away closes the song, resolved in a minor key. Overall, this may be the weakest track, at least on this first disc. This is the It Was All We Knew equivalent of this album, and it even has the same track number too. Anyway, we then finally get to the last official track, I guess, which is A Living Island. Hal forgot his electric guitar again. Honestly, for the last three tracks, guitar parts have been mostly carried by the acoustic variant. The song opens with a classically focused acoustic guitar riff. It's very nice, but it ends rather quickly, and suddenly a piano playing chords shows up, with nothing to do with what came before it. Pretty certain we hear nothing resembling the opening guitar bit later in the song. You could have just left it out completely. This song takes on a pop country feel. John sings quite a low melody here, and the classical guitar fills up the space in the melody fairly nicely. Despite how nice the melody is, I can't stop myself from singing Walking in Memphis by Mark Cohn in this place. I mean, the chords are almost identical, and the tempo is also a near match. Put on my blue suede shoes and I boarded the plane. Touchdown in the land of the Delta Blue in the middle of the pouring rain. After the first verse, we get some panning synth sounding. <laughs> the next verse features a slow buildup of <coughs> instruments. Hi-hat, bass, and eventually drums come in in full, played by brushes again. It's a more commercial sounding song for the moment. It's uh, even a bit Asia-like. The melodic movements are pretty solid, though they do have their dodgy moments. Some moments are more complex and unexpected, but you just generally hook into the vibe and sway away. As we go on with these verses, a light organ shows up to play a counter melody in the background. And it's literally set to the tune of Walking in Memphis. But it sounds more like the Lone Star cover of the song. Walking in Memphis. Standing with my feet ten feet off a beat. Walking in Memphis. This is ridiculous! I mean, who wrote this song? Wait, let me check the credits here. Davison and... Downs! Motherfucker! Does Downs think you wrote Walking in Memphis too? I mean, I don't know the details behind their songwriting, so I can't say who's responsible for this line, but it would make sense, right? That's Downs playing the keyboard line, so it makes sense that he wrote that bit. But, I mean... It would be one thing if it was just the chords that sound like Walking in Memphis, or even that simple melody organ by itself sounds a bit like Walking in Memphis. Over different chords, maybe it would be completely unnoticeable. I'd give it the benefit of a doubt. But both chords and the chord rhythm, the tempo and the melody is too close of a match to say that it's a coincidence. I don't know if he's doing it intentionally, or maybe he has no idea he's plagiarizing again and just gets this idea from his head and thinks it's his own. I mentioned this in the Heaven and Earth video that Subway Walls, which was largely composed by him, borrows heavily from an older Asia track. Maybe he doesn't realize that he recorded it already. Anyway, getting past that, there's a lot of contrasting complexity of chords and bass, especially between these latter tracks and what came before on the album. Things generally took a bit of a nosedive after the Western Edge. Back to the song, a linking section reappears again, which ushers in more backing vocals. A really jaunty line that's difficult to keep track. Uh, I, don't, I really don't like it. Downs comes out of the shadows just for a little while to perform an organ solo, which is followed by an acoustic guitar solo. And this is where things start sounding awesome. Vocal. <laughs> take over in this new section, which is slightly faster in tempo. Sixteenths on brushed snares brushing away, and it's awesomely uplifting in spirit. 
It's nice to hear them change the tempo subtly like this. Too much nowadays, musicians feel restricted to the metronome and are quantized to match the beat. So this one is beautiful. They got some Indian percussion in here too. And just as it was getting great, it catapults itself straight down into a definite how solo section with a basic halftime feel on sticky drums now. It's all simplistic again. Some light lyrics are added on and lead into the line, waking up from the nightmare, which leads back into the brushy faster bit, quite intense now because of the clashing vocal harmonies as well. And then back again to house almost graduation theme sound progression and a shitty electric guitar solo. Hey, well, at least he found his electric guitar again. There's a continuing back and forth between vocals and guitar now. John sings very commemorative and respective lyrics to some honorable people, I'm sure. This cycles round quite a few times until one final FOREVERMORE finishes the track with a resounding resolution. That was weird. It feels like a totally different song by the end of it. I mean, sure, this is prog rock, but personally, logically, it doesn't fall very well from that gentle country rhythm of the beginning. I'd rather have that brushy bit longer and further developed, and we could have left out that slow, epic graduation march entirely. That section smells like how, but I could be wrong. So anyway, this is kind of the end of the album if you're on vinyl, I guess. But wait, there's more. If you got the CD release, you got discs, one and two. So let's get on to two. First up is Sister Sleeping Soul, a Davison and Howe collab. You hear Howe's name a lot around these here parts, don't you? Opens with a theme played on Howe's Hawaiian by the Laika now. It has a flamenco flavor to it, which is nice. I can also hear some timbalas, I believe, those Indian percussion instruments from the previous track. The verse opens with all the band joining in. More drumming with brushes again, giving it a laid-back feel. And the melody is quite lovely, though it does sound like a sped-up version of the one in Dare to Know. Where have you gone? My heart full of song. Oh, sister of my soul. Chords remain happy and simple. The bass is slightly more complex now, uh, and the chorus is satisfyingly catchy and features focused motifs. The song has a double chorus effect in that halfway through the chorus, they change up the mood a bit to sing Sister Sleeping Soul, punctuated with a side stick rhythm on all fours. The second verse is a more vague, more melodically free version of the first verse. The melody moves around more and is not locked into the set pattern that was previously established. We got some more accentuations from synth flutes and strings here, uh, which sound a bit like a mellotron, a sign of things to come. <sighs> then we get a return to the opening motif, with more band now and the lyrics in my heart, you belong, with echo too. too. The tom sounds strong here. Then back to the chorus we go. We get treated with the entry of a new section in the middle here. Hey, I can you free your mind? With some runs on a vintage sounding synth. As how provides la 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 in the back. This section also introduces some occasional castanets to add to the Mediterranean flavor. This is followed by another reprise of on how's Argentinian lute. And then the chorus motif, but the melody is played on a downs synth solo. I don't know, some, somehow I don't like the sound. It's like a fake modular synth. Something to do with the attack speed of the voice doesn't sit well with me. It could be slower and that way it would sound more natural and uh, fading in. Uh. Afterwards, John comes back to do a little reprise of the slower Sister Sleeping Soul section. Not to mention lots of multilayer conflating la 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 la's from everyone. And then the song ends fairly cheerfully. Personally, this this bonus leftover track, whatever it is, should have replaced the music to my ears on on the first disc. I think it's a much stronger track. Then we get to Mystery Tour. As you might expect, yes, this is a blatant tribute to the Beatles, and it comes from the genius mind of Steve Howe. A reverse cymbal crash ushers in the band, and we get into the groove. It's disappointing. More acoustic guitar, and a happy-go-lucky simple beat and arrangement. Since it's very blatantly about the Beatles, you got Beatlesque Mellotron flutes in the back, and some of the chord progressions are also something you'd hear from the boys from Liverpool. The lyrics, though, my god. 
Okay, so... <laughs> So right now, I'm a rip a page right out of the playbook of that eminent sage and music reviewer, Danthony Kustano, and just recite some of the lyrics for you, just because sometimes you can't really understand how bad things can really get through just a description or a summary of it, so you just have to hear it for yourself. John was a fighter, his fist in a glove. Across the universe, he spoke of love. Paul was a worker, but he got the blame. When the party was over, we all felt the same. They all let it be, like they never been born, yada yada yada. It's like that one scene in Rotor, my favorite movie of all time, where they're in the presentation meeting about the future of robot police, and everyone's just working in Beach Boys song titles into their conversation for some reason. Anyway, lyrically, the song consists of descriptions of the band members very obviously, like without any sort of crypticism, and their producer and engineers or something, and a very roundabout way to describe the rise and fall of the Beatles. It has very active backing vocals, and unfortunately, this is the track where Sherwood gets to be creative and adventurous again. The chorus has a very strong beat, lots of 16s from percussion and wild bass. Very 60s-like. Pretty sure there's a cowbell in there for good measure as well. It's like Davidson sings lead, and then Sherwood stacks up some harmonies for one motif in the back, and then Howe does his own harmonized bit as well. It's like they don't really gel that much, and they all do their own thing. Anyway, after the second chorus, there's a shitty guitar solo. Not much else to say. Then a toned down verse with less percussion and the serious tone to symbolize how the band was falling apart. And then one final repeating chorus. Howe plays an admittedly cool pattern that repeats a few times towards the end. Shining like the moon and the stars on the mystery tour. But yeah, it's short. It's um, I don't, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't belong on on a Yes album, that's for sure. Bumpy Ride was goofy enough, but I think we've sur actually sur surpassed, surpassed. What's the what's the opposite of surpass? Sur, surp and derp. Dirt pass. We, 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 we have definitely dirt passed it with this one. I consider this a new low for the band. <laughs> Honestly, I'd rather just get, get this done and over with and, and move on to the last track. We're almost finished. Last up is Damaged World, which is basically another Steve Howe solo track. It's an easy groove, got a shuffle rhythm to it, and actually a combo of acoustic guitar and also electric guitar for once. There's some soaring synths thrown into the mix here as well, and the verse is in, yes, you guessed it, half time. Basically, the lead vocals are from Howe, with Davison providing occasional harmonies, dipping out so we can hear Howe sing, Save this damaged world. A surprise organ solo line follows after verse 1. Then Steve Howe truly sings lead vocals, solo lead vocals for the next verse, which picks up the pace and morphs into regular time. The chorus has a lot of contributions from Davison, with Howe taking over in the spaces left over. Um, I have not said this yet. Many people have been saying this for 10 years now, but I think it's time even for me to say it. This is not yes. And it's not for the reason that everyone else is saying, because there's no John Anderson, because there's no Wakeman, because now, because there's no Chris Squire, whatever it is, it's just, it's just members of Yes, especially for this track. I mean, you've been hearing hints for the, for the entirety of the album, but especially at the last track, it's just members of Yes playing tracks that didn't make it onto Steve Howe's Love Is solo album. This does not warrant the Yes name, personally. Anyway, another two verses follow, switching between halftime and full time. Man, how should <laughs> how should not be leading vocals? Save this damaged world. He he was never a great singer and simply does not physically possess the potential even for distinctive good singing. There is another surprise synth solo again, and then another chorus. Interestingly, the shuffle departs and we get a straight backbeat then, playing under a minor variation of the chorus structure, dominated by guitar and organ solos now. Claps add a nice vintage feel to the percussion. Then the song goes back into the shuffle, and then one more chorus. Seemingly it finishes, but it doesn't. Guitar and synth strings play the guitar line he had played during the verses now. Do, 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 do. Du, du, du. And they play this for a couple of times as the song fades out. And that's the end. 
man, this album. Obviously, it's very how led to begin with, but even so, the first half of the tracks had that Yes flair to them. There were definitely Yes songs composed by Steve Howe, but at the end right here, I don't know what their reasoning was for including these bonus tracks. It's as if it was a way for Steve to show off his excellent gentle songwriting skills and awesome singing abilities because more people would listen to his low-key stuff on a Yes titled album than his solo stuff. So when rating the quest as a whole, it starts off so strong. The Ice Bridge, which is not really Yes, sounds great regardless, and is the most up-tempo number on the album. I guess they're not really in the mood to play fast songs anymore because, you know, their age. They lose a lot of spunk as the album progresses. Honestly, it's like they started working on the album from the first track and then just went down the line, progressively getting more tired until the final song. The drums sound a lot better than in, in the previous album, but a bit overcompressed and just too loud even in the mix sometimes as well. Vocally, the melodies are more complex than in their previous album and just works out as being just more unfocused. You don't know what to listen to, and sure as hell, you're gonna have a tough time singing along with them as well. Even with John Anderson's inane mystical ramblings about rivers, the words still followed a coherent melody. As a result, these new tracks are less memorable, because they're way overly complex vocal-wise at least. On the plus side, it was nice hearing the band explore new adventurous instrumentation, leaving the absolute bore fest of heaven and earth way past behind them. Uh, so if I were to rate The Quest on its main CD only, the real album so to speak, I would give it a 7.1 out of 10. If I were to include the entire 11 tracks that come with the CD release, it would be a 6.5 out of 10. The Quest was released, of course, on October 1st, 2021. It features, of course, the obligatory Roger Dean artwork which has been looking very bland and uninspired for quite a while now, because every little album compilation that, that they release, they have to include a Dean painting on it, so he's just really just shitting them out now, one after the other. So yeah, but I, I loved hearing Sherwood's contributions, and I think he fits in great. As for the future of the band, I for one would love for it to continue as an idea, an identity, not bound by any members. Of course, there have been so many lineup changes over the years, people coming and going and coming back and leaving again. So I think Yes should be more about the music. Whatever people there are, they should honor the Yes tradition of music and um, they can take it into new places if they want, if they feel it is beneficial, but I would just love for it to continue with new members all the time. I mean, there's no original members in the band for five years now already. You could say that Steve Howe is like an honorary original member. He's obviously the creative dictator of the band now. Shit, they already have Jay Shellen ready to take over once Alan White dies or decides he's not able enough to carry the sticks anymore. I fear that the only thing that is holding back my vision of an eternal yes is, um, is Steve Howe. I don't know legally who owns the yes name now, but maybe Howe thinks that the band should die with him. Sure as hell he's not gonna live and allow another guitarist to take over him. Speaking of Howe, I got something prepared that I want to show you. So... Let me play this little video right now. So in this video that you're seeing, I am unboxing a certain record. One of my earliest discographies, Yes fans, Lil Gary the Fifth or Lil Gary V on YouTube and most places online, and who is now a mod on the channel and on the Geno Samuel Discord, he is a Yes fan too, based in the States. Over two years ago now, we made a deal to trade some Yes merch. I would send him some Japan-only high-quality Yes discs while he would get an album specially signed just for me. He got special VIP meet and greet tickets to see Yes at the time. Our plan was that it would be funny if he got Steve Howe to sign a record with something like uh, To My Biggest Fan, Gino Samuel from Steve Howe. You know, cause I fucking hate Steve Howe. Unfortunately, he wouldn't do a custom message. So instead, he had all the band members sign it. That unboxing video was recorded actually over two years ago now, I think. Back then I had like three more Yes albums to review and I kept putting it off because I was too busy. But anyway, here it is. Close to the Edge. Signed by the guitarist of the album and four other guys who had nothing to do with it. I treasure this. Thank you, little Gary. Thank you very much. Hope you keep supporting me still. 
he was badgering on about about uh, showing that unboxing video for like two years now. Finally got your wish. So this seems to be the end. I don't know if they'll ever make something new, but if they do, I'll be back. It's been close to three years in the making, but I'm finally up to date. <sighs> it's been fun. It's been arduous. It's been uh, enlightening to listen to all these songs, all these albums again, and um, figure out what makes them tick. Kind of inspires me too. Yeah. So thank you very much for watching up to this point. If you like what you see, please like the video and subscribe to my channel for some original music and maybe I'll do another discographies further down the line, either Yes or uh, or another band. We'll see. If you're interested in supporting me, please check out the links in the description below for some Patreon stuff and maybe donations as well. So this has been Discographies Yes by Gino Samuel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you around. And some of the chord progressions are also something you'd hear from the Liverpool. Something you'd hear from the Liverpool. Some, something that you'd hear from the Liverpool for. That's a difficult word to say. The lyrics, though.